Episode 149 of the Outdoor Minimalist Podcast is brought to you courtesy of the Sustainable Jungle. At Sustainable Jungle, their mission is clear, to inspire and educate all on the journey toward a more sustainable life. They dive into tips, tricks, and stories centered around sustainability, serving up engaging content through their podcast, website, newsletter, and social media channels. Their goal is to make sustainability an integral part of everyday living, embracing progress over perfection while supporting those who genuinely make a positive impact. With a diverse team of experts from environmental scientists to green living advocates, they provide reliable nuanced insights to guide your eco-friendly adventures. They believe in blending essential information with a touch of humor and optimism to keep your journey enjoyable and uplifting. Tune into their podcast to explore the path to a greener, more sustainable world together. Welcome back to the Sustainable Jungle Podcast. I'm Joy and today I'm speaking with Meg Carney. Meg is an outdoor and environmental writer with a passion for environmental advocacy. We discuss her deep connection to the natural environment, her book, The Outdoor Minimalist, and her podcast by the same name. But mostly we focus on her current original podcast show called Forever Chemicals, which dives deep into the history and impact of PFAS and the direct actions we can take to make a difference to the planet and people. As always, you can find the show notes with all the relevant links for this episode at sustainablejungle.com forward slash podcast. Now let's talk Forever Chemicals with Meg Carney. Meg Carney, welcome to our show. Let's get right into it by starting with a bit more about you. Where were you born and where did you grow up? Awesome. Thanks for having me, Joy. I'm really excited to be here. So I was born in the United States in the state of Minnesota. And I grew up in like a really rural (laughs) section of the state as basically like a farming community in the southern portion. And like the climate is pretty cold because it's in the northern part of the country. But we do have four seasons, which is really nice. And if you're interested in like the ecology, because there's a lot of different types of ecology in the United States. I was raised on the prairie. So it'd be kind of like the Great Plains region of the country. Looking at your 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 LinkedIn profile, I see that you've you've got this love of the outdoors threaded through everything that you've done. So what created this passion for you? And maybe it's because you grew up, you know, in <laughs> the bit of exposure to it. But I wanted to know if there's if there's more to the story there. Yeah, I mean, I would say it has a lot to do with my upbringing. And so when my family moved back to Minnesota and I was born. We lived on my grandparents' property and mm-hmm. um, it's about 400 acres of just prairie mm-hmm. land. It's very beautiful. And there's an easement on the property, so it can't be developed. So it can't be used for farmland or like you can't put buildings on it and stuff. It's like designated for conservation. And that was really cool, I think, because like being young and having the ability to go and just like roam around, uh, experience the wildlife in the area. So like I could see wild turkeys and white-tailed deer. There were otters and beavers like on the property. And my grandfather worked in conservation as a conservationist and a farmer, but mostly a conservationist from like what I remember. He was mostly a farmer before that. And so like when he would be doing daycare for me and my brother while my parents are at work. We would just be going around our, the farm and he'd be showing us the different plants and insects mm-hmm. and how they change throughout the seasons. And so that was like an early installment of like very formative years being exposed to the natural environment. And like ever since then, it has been almost a necessity, I feel like for me to make sure I spend time outside every single day. Otherwise, my mental health really struggles. And I think it has a lot to do with the fact that like most of my childhood, I was just outside, like free roaming, exploring, doing kid things, you know? Mm. And then- What a wonderful way to grow up. Oh, yeah. It was amazing. I didn't realize it at the time, but I think when I left for university, I like made the connections of like, oh, a lot of people don't have that experience. And I was really fortunate and privileged mm-hmm. to be able to like grow up in that environment. So I wanted to know a little bit more about your journey from there. So what led you, you know, from growing up on the prairie to to what you do now as a as a outdoor and sustainability writer and a podcast podcast host. 
Yeah, so it was kind of an organic journey, I would say. I went to university for communication arts and literature in the northern part of Minnesota. And that area is kind of like a mecca in the Midwest for outdoor recreation. And like, as I got older as a kid, I participated in a lot of outdoor recreation sports. In the southern part of the state, it's largely like hunting and fishing. And then as I grew older, I became interested in other things like rock climbing, hiking, paddling, etc. Like the normal things people think of when they think of going outside. And after university, I wanted to travel around the United States. So most of my 20s, I lived out of my, a vehicle of some kind and just kind of took odd jobs here and there in the outdoor industry, like guiding, working in climbing gyms, like just a bunch of random stuff. And then I just started to kind of miss uh, writing <laughs> because that's yeah. something that I went to school for and I was really passionate about it. So I was trying to find ways to integrate it. And so I became a freelance writer, which I still am a freelance writer full time today. And so I did it part time, like to fill gaps in my employment. And then eventually, I was like, why don't I just do this full time? And then I have control over my schedule, I can kind of like pursue things I'm passionate about. And so that's what I did. That was about seven years ago now. And I started writing mostly in the outdoor industry. But I wanted to kind of um, like bridge the gap that I felt because I really wanted to write more about environmental topics because that was something that was important to me. And so I started to try and like integrate those things into my writing. And that led to where I am today with publishing the Outdoor Minimalist book and starting the podcast and kind of like changing directions a little bit in terms of not only the media that I am producing in journalism, but also like the topics that I'm pursuing. Very cool. So that's a nice segue into the Outdoor Minimalist. So what is it exactly and when did you start it? Yeah, so Outdoor Minimalist is a book and a podcast. And the book came out in 2022, in the fall of 2022. And the podcast was actually released a year before that, because hmm. what happened was I finished the manuscript. It was with my publisher and editor. And we were doing like the final things with like formatting, editing, all the fun book stuff that you have to do. And that takes like about a year. And coming off the coattails of the COVID-19 pandemic, a lot of the publishing, like book publishing processes kind of got delayed because of the supply chain. And so the book was actually supposed to come out almost like nine months before the, the publishing date, but it got pushed back. So I was like, what am I supposed to be doing right now? Like, I want to be talking about these topics because I wrote a book about them. Obviously, I care about them. And so then I started the podcast as a way to kind of like expand on the topics in the book. And the topics mm -hmm. of the book are about the outdoor industry and how individuals can lessen their impact or minimize their impact and like better align with nature and the earth even before they get out hiking on the trail. Because like Leave No Trace is pretty standard, I think, across the board for most people who go outside. And I think that's important and essential. But I didn't notice like quite enough discourse around um, like the products that we're buying or like how to take care of our gear or how to get involved in restoration and conservation efforts and the food that we're eating and all of those things. And so that was kind of like my draw to talking about those topics. And because the book, I would say is more targeted for individuals. So like, just general people that want to get outside. And then the podcast, there's definitely content for individuals, but a large bulk of the content is also tailored towards industry professionals. So people who work in the outdoor industry, they're actually making the products um, and kind of forming a community of collaboration around like environmentalism and conservation and how we can be better stewards as an industry. Very cool. Very practically on your book, one thing that I saw that's included in there was packing lists to waste oh, lists yes. with every plant. So it's like got really practical things that you could, as an as you said, like as an individual, you could learn about, you know, and and you know, maximize your positive impact or minimize your negative impact when out there by uh by packing right. Very cool. 
Yeah, and I would say like with the book, you could sit down and read it like cover to cover. But I think the intention with the way that I format it and wrote it was that it could be a reference guide. So like if you are going on a trip, then you could open the book and be like, these are the things that I would need. And then if you need to purchase something for your trip, say like boots or a backpack or something, you could go to the different sections, learn about the materials, how to identify like ethical production processes and things like that. Um, so I would say like, that's, that's more of the vision that I had, but I do know people who have just read it outright and that's really great. And I'm glad that they did that. Um, yeah. so there's definitely options there. <laughs> so cool. And the podcast, so you have well over 100 episodes, like we were talking about before we started recording and a ton of really impressive guests. And, you know, obviously I'm a podcaster too. And so I'm really curious about, about what do you, what do you look for in your guests? What do you look for as in like your ideal guest? I think my ideal guest is someone who is really, really passionate about a specific topic in the outdoor industry, uh, environmentalism, conservation, any of those things, like, and someone that really, really wants to nerd out about that specific topic. Like, they are, I guess I would consider them experts in those areas, and they have dedicated their lives to those things, and they have a lot of information to share to the general public. And so I basically want to give them a platform to, like, amplify their voice because they're the ones that are doing most of like the boots on the ground work. And I think that that should be celebrated. Awesome. Absolutely. And if anybody wants to check out your podcast, but has limited time, and I know it's hard to pick favorites, but <laughs> if you could like suggest one episode, that's like, this is my, like my episode that I would suggest if someone's like, Oh, what should I listen to first? Um, aside from the PFAS ones, cause we're about to chat about that. But mm -hmm. do you have like an all time, like go to episode at, that you suggest to people to listen to, to begin with? Yeah, so I would say um, if I were recommending like a starting point for people, there's two episodes which are kind of like roundups from the year. Mm -hmm. So like best of 2023, and they're the top five episodes from that year, like according to downloads. But if I had to pick like one specific episode that I really loved and like I could tell like it got quite a few downloads, people were interested in the topic was episode 112 and it's titled does it matter if i pick up my dog's poop or not <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it's like it's a topic that most people i feel like aren't really wanting to talk about but for that episode i interviewed rose seaman and she's the founder of the enviro pet waste network uh based out of boulder colorado and she actually was the one who like initiated the city of Boulder to start to collect dog waste and compost it like citywide for the municipality. And I thought that that was amazing. And she has a ton of great content on her website. She's also an author about like how to properly compost your dog waste. And I think <laughs> it's a very like niche topic, I guess, but it's one that I think impacts more people than they would assume. I mean, so many people have dogs. And so if we can learn how to like, properly manage their waste, then we can like lessen the spread of disease from animals to humans to other animals, and also like, lessen the general pollution of water sources in the areas that we live. Very cool. I'm going to definitely listen to that because we've <laughs> finally moved into a house that we built that's like a sustainable or more sustainable house than your average house and we want to like you know extend it to the garden and make sure that we've got a good composting facility for our dog's poop and I just thought it was simple as like getting a special device that composts dog poop but it sounds like there might be more to the story like where we place it and how we you know and how we think about it and how what we have to put in there so it sounds like a good one to check out I will do that thanks for that <laughs> it is it's a and, good one yeah. And the other thing I wanted to ask you about on the podcast is the name of the pod, the name, the publishing name is Black Footed Ferret Productions, which sounds like a very intriguing name. So I want to know the backstory if you're willing to share. Yeah. So Black Footed Ferret Productions is the production company that I started with my brother and a family friend. And Outdoor Minimalist podcast and the Forever Chemicals podcast are grouped under that, but we definitely plan on expanding. 
And like I mentioned about like where I would grow up and I'm from is the prairie. Um, and it's a tall grass prairie, which is the habitat of a black footed ferret. And uh-huh. when I was a kid, black footed ferrets were actually considered extinct, but they were rediscovered in Wyoming by wow. a farmer. Um, actually, his dog caught like brought home a ferret from somewhere on their property and he was like wait a minute i'm pretty sure these are extinct and so he brought it to the dnr or natural resources center in his area and they went and found the where the ferrets lived and they've basically reintroduced them they're still an endangered species but their population has grown like exponentially in the last like few decades because of that rediscovery and i was like obsessed with animals <laughs> when I was a kid. And I read all the kids, National Geographic and like Jane Goodall, all those like good biology type books, you know, or magazines. And so ferrets were always kind of on my radar. And <laughs> I think when we were trying to pick a name for the production company, we didn't want it to necessarily be just outdoor minimalist because we wanted to expand in more like conservation topics um and so i was like black footed ferrets should be the name because (laughs) i've always loved ferrets they're extremely adorable and they're associated with the prairie which all three of us are from the prairie and then like hopefully as we grow as a production company we could cover some content around like the ferret conservation um because there isn't quite I feel like there's not enough knowledge around like a lot of the endangered species or even extinct species in North America mm-hmm. um, outside of like just general like public TV. And so I'd, I'd love to focus more on that. I know that was a really long answer, but <laughs> I love long that story answer. short, I'm obsessed with ferrets. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's also like so representative of like the true element of what you're trying to do with your content because it's like a happy story and it it shows sort of what our ultimate goal is with, with, um, with trying to shine a light on these issues. You know, it's these, these guys were extinct and came back and now they are thriving, which is just such a happy story. So I think that's perfect name. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think in the conservation world, they're kind of seen as like a little beacon of hope of like, okay, it's yeah. possible to reintroduce animals and it's possible to conserve these landscapes. Yeah, that's that's special. Okay, let's talk about the PFAS series. So you've spent <laughs> six plus months researching, interviewing, and producing this series about PFAS. So there's obviously a lot to say on the topic. So perhaps we just start with the basics. What are PFAS and what made you want to go so deep on this topic? So PFAS is an acronym, P-F-A-S, and it stands for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, which is just a really like long scientific name for synthetic man-made chemicals. They're also referred to as Forever Chemicals, which is the title of the 10-part podcast, Forever Chemicals. And what made me interested in talking about a class of chemicals is I saw a documentary um, called The Devil We Know. It came out in 2018 or 2019, but it follows the story of lawyer Robert Balot in West Virginia as he essentially took on the creator of these chemicals, DuPont, uh, now Camorse. And the reason that that I don't know, that documentary, it was so disturbing. It was deeply disturbing to me <laughs> as a viewer, and I recommend it to everyone. If you're not a documentary person, then I recommend recommend Dark Waters, which came out more recently. And that film features Mark Ruffalo plays Robert Blot. Um, so it's like a dramatization of his story. Um, but essentially, the documentary covers the 20 years that this lawyer took for this lawsuit. It was a class action lawsuit against DuPont for the people in Parkersburg, West Virginia, because those chemicals that they were using in their products uh, were leaching out into the water sources. So they effectively polluted and poisoned an entire town of people and animals. And so that's what that lawsuit was about. And that movie, because it was such like a huge scientific cover up and 
like there was so much denial on the chemical company's part. I think that it like, it just kind of stuck with me. And so like, I couldn't like shake the thought of like, okay, what are these chemicals? And I wanted to learn more. And the more that I learned about it and the more that I read about it, I was like, wow, this is crazy. Like this is so expansive and it impacts every single living thing on earth. And why don't I know more about it? And why isn't there more coverage on this topic. And since I work in the outdoor industry, like with most of my journalism, I started to like look into outdoor industry companies. And I was like, wow, the United States really dropped the ball here in terms of like the companies that make things for outdoor recreation. So companies like Patagonia or WL Gore and Associates who make Gore-Tex. I was like, they kind of just went along with the status quo and I wasn't necessarily okay with that as a consumer because, um, yeah, PFAS are dangerous, which I can explain more about that as well. Yeah. So, I mean, I think it's safe to say they're, they're pretty problematic. And I know that you cover this in great amounts of detail on your podcast. So let's for sure encourage folks to go and listen to the longer format of the answer um, and the whole series for that matter. But in a nutshell, could you share what you've learned about how, you know, sort of like the timeline and the history of how we got into this hot mess? Like what is the, aside from sort of they were invented by, by DuPont, what is the history of the chemicals? How did they get into the mainstream? Yeah. So, I mean, once they were discovered in 1938 and then DuPont adopted them for Teflon, um, which Teflon pans <laughs> uh, one, are like the common PFAS or kind of like what the PFAS that started this whole issue. And so after DuPont kind of launched PFAS into the consumer market, I would say like more largely in the 50s and 60s, um, then other chemical companies like 3M, which is Minnesota mining and manufacturing company, they started to adopt it for things like Scotchgard, which is no longer really being used. But I know like growing up in the 90s, like we scotch guarded everything. And yeah, it was I like a thing you spray movie. on your shoes and your clothes and your everything to make it waterproof, like water repellent, dirt repellent, oil repellent, all of those good things. And the reason that PFAS became so widely used in the consumer market is because it was so high performing. So like as a synthetic chemical, which I do want to clarify, like when I say PFAS, I'm actually talking about like a class of chemicals, not just one thing, um, which complicates the issue further, because depending on the expert you talk to, there's anywhere from like 10,000 to 12,000 to 14,000 plus different types of PFAS chemicals. And so wow. it makes it extremely hard to control and regulate, but I digress. So the reason that it became really, really popular for other consumer goods, so things like clothes, carpets, cosmetics, even um, like food packaging and different types of plastics was because it was high performing and it could repel water, it could repel oil, it can repel dirt. And there's not really any other chemical that can do all of those things. And at the time, people really didn't know, like manufacturers didn't really know that this could be dangerous for human health or the environment. Mm -hmm. And that's because the chemical creators, DuPont and 3M, essentially manipulated their science. They outright lied and they hid the information, not only from the public, but the scientific communities. Um, so people were just like unaware until Robert Balot exposed them in the early 2000s. So essentially for decades, we were using a chemical that could cause cancers, could cause reproductive harm, and a laundry list of other health issues without any control or regulation. And still to this day, it's a very difficult to regulate. And there's a lot of pushback from chemical companies because oftentimes they're focusing on profit over kind of like people and planet, um, which is a bummer, but it is the truth. And so, yeah, that's kind of how we got into this mess. And like, I guess to like show or like explain the expansiveness of the issue, 
there have been studies like in the last decade or even last five years um, that have looked at like the blood of all people in the world from like a variety of different locations. And essentially it's been concluded that there are traces of PFAS that can be found in every living thing on earth because, because it is such a long lasting and effective chemical. It's highly durable and it has the ability to migrate. So like once it enters the environment, so say like if we take the DuPont example and it goes off into the water sources in that area, then the PFAS can kind of like follow the stream or, and then go out into different bodies of water. It can enter the soil and migrate in a variety of different ways and then enter the food systems. And so it can be found in the oceans. So most fish that we are eating uh, probably contain PFAS. There's one expert scientist that I interviewed for my podcast, and he said that there was a study, I think it was even in the 90s, that PFAS was found in albatrosses in the Pacific. And they obviously have no exposure to it other than the environment they're living in. And so like, it's everywhere. And it's crazy to me that we haven't been talking about it more and that I've just been learning about it in the last five years, because I feel like it's a very large human health crisis, <laughs> for lack of a better term. The reason that it's so good at causing health problems is because it bioaccumulates. So the chemicals themselves can attach to our fatty tissues and they have something called half-lives. And so it just, it takes a really, really long time for that half-life to then break down. So oftentimes if we have a PFOS enter our body from drinking water, which is the most common exposure for humans, um, then it's going to live there for about six to eight years before it's expelled from our body in some way, which oftentimes is like giving blood or giving birth, which are like the two primary ways you expel PFOS from your body. And that bioaccumulation then is what can cause health effects down the line. So like, even if you live in an area that has very, very small traces of PFOS in your water and you're drinking that water every single day without filtering the PFOS out, then in like 10, 15 years, you could develop a cancer caused by that PFOS um, simply because it bioaccumulates and you can't eliminate it from your body. It's truly terrifying. So yeah. the... <laughs> So that that leads us into like what the heck are we doing about it? So the um so the lawsuit that you mentioned, the twenty year lawsuit, was that won by the people? Yeah, so they did settle that lawsuit and actually there are still many lawsuits going on and Robert Ballot leads is leading another lawsuit that um is like hoping to protect all of essentially the firefighters in the United States because PFAS it used to be used in a triple F firefighting foam and turnout gear. And so like the number one killer of firefighters in the United States is actually cancers. And they believe that that is caused from PFAS exposure. And so that's the lawsuit he's working on right now. But the original lawsuit against DuPont in West Virginia was won by him. And essentially the largest scientific study on like human health and PFAS was conducted because of that lawsuit. Because what happened was there were so many citizens that had been exposed and they wanted proof essentially that they had high levels of PFAS and that that was a correlation with disease. And so for people to get the settlement money from the lawsuit, they had to give their blood and then they got their whatever amount was awarded to them. Um, and so I was, I think it was like over 90% of the people in the town and the surrounding area that were affected, they actually did give their blood. And so they had this huge data set to prove like, yes, these are dangerous. And from that lawsuit, then the EPA got involved, which is the United States Amer Environmental Protection Agency. And they began to regulate the type of PFOS that DuPont used in Teflon, which is PFOA and PFOS. But then from that lawsuit, um, DuPont began to use a shorter chain PFOS, which is referred to as Gen X. And so there's a lot of issues, at least in the United States, with regulating because like 
the way our regulatory body works is you have to prove a chemical is dangerous in order for it to be regulated. And whereas like for our food and drug administration, like a drug needs to be proven that it's safe before it goes on the market, but it's like the opposite for chemicals. Like you can be using a chemical and then it has to be proven that it has a dangerous health effect for then it to be regulated. And so that's why they then switched to a different type of PFAS, which is now proven to be even more dangerous than the original ones. So it's like, we're just going in circles here and it's crazy. That is crazy. So what's happening in other countries? What's happening in the EU? Um, so the European Union, I would say, has a bit more regulation than some other areas. I would say like, uh, actually, Australia, Canada and the EU have like pretty good parameters and like goals set for PFAS. Um, and the European Union, they follow like two primary regulatory systems, which is the POP regulations, which is persistent organic pollutants, and then the REACH regulations, which is registration, evaluation, authorization, and restriction of chemicals. And both of those two are grouped under the Stockholm Conventions. I think both of them are anyway, at least the pop regulations are. Don't quote me on that. <laughs> yeah, that's um, a lot, a lot yeah. to memorize. Literally, yeah. And so um, those ones, they started regulating at least PFOS under their pop regulations in 2009. Um, and then they started to add more like progressively over time. And then the REACH regulation has several different types of PFOS on their list of substances of high concern, which I don't know how to like compare that to another regulatory system. But the problem with the European Union's regulations would be that there's not a, an overarching or like broad definition of PFAS. So they're also running into some issues of like, okay, they can regulate PFOS and PFOA, but if there's say 14,000 different PFAS, what about all of the other ones? And so yeah. I think when I was making the podcast, which episode four overviews regulations, both in the United States and the European Union, but those experts that kind of developed the regulations for the Stockholm Convention, they were saying that they're working towards getting a broad definition, like push through. So then mm -hmm. all PFAS, anything classified as PFAS could then be regulated. It, which sounds like a, just a no-brainer. <laughs> yeah, so, like it makes sense. But like if there are people lobbying against the regulations, which oftentimes um, like producers will regulate or push against regulations in the United States, the Environmental Protection Agency is largely controlled by industry. And so mm -hmm. they aren't doing enough definitely not doing enough to like push regulation and legislation through to actually protect against those things. Gosh. And um, I guess for the, for the outdoor industry, which is your, you know, topic of expertise in particular, <laughs> so much of the gear and clothing is made from materials that are rife with PFAS with the waterproofing and all that. So as you mentioned, that's how you became interested in it. How is the industry thinking about this issue now and what are they doing practically to sort of address it? I would say the outdoor industry was unfortunately like a laggard in adopting like a move away from PFAS. However, many European brands were kind of ahead of the curve. And that's because I can't remember the exact year. It was um, like 2012, between 2008 and 2012, somewhere in that range, Greenpeace had this report that was called Chemistry for Any Weather that basically went out to all these outdoor industry brands saying, hey, in your rain gear, you're using these dangerous hazardous chemicals, PFAS, which we understand provide a high performance, but the, this is the science saying that this is dangerous. And we encourage you, or like basically saying, we really, really, really encourage you and want you to stop using them because there has to be other options. You can innovate other options. Um, so please do so. And so European companies like Jack Wolfskin, 
Houdini Sportswear. Um, trying to think of other ones. Fjall Robin. Um, those three were like pretty top tier, like since 2009 and forward, they kind of like trickled in with adopting and developing new chemistries and working with their manufacturing supply chain to like educate them and be like, Hey, like, we don't want to be using PFAS. We don't think you should. It's not good for your workers. And um, so they helped a lot in the supply chain and they proved that it could be done. And then in, like, I want to say once it happened in Europe with those companies, um, a little bit later in the 2000s, so like 2022, <laughs> which is not that much, which is not that long ago, um, <laughs> the United States NRDC then released a new report um, that was like essentially a survey of all outdoor industry brands and their approach to the PFOS problem. And essentially they exposed uh, the United States market saying, Hey, it's been proven that you can remove PFOS from your equipment. Um, it still performs really well. Why haven't you done it? Because they did it in Europe. So can you please do it here? And that report, um, I think alerted some brands they started working on it a little bit more but quite honestly most united states brands did not really jump on board with moving away from pfos until the state of california banned it in textiles and so by 2025 they have to have it removed if they want to sell any of their items in the state of california which california is a huge economy like the fifth or sixth largest in the world. And so they have the ability to change a lot of things in terms of like uh, better manufacturing processes, which I think is really great. Um, it's just kind of a bummer that, that that regulation had to be the thing to kind of move the needle. And yeah. I want to say <laughs> there's definitely companies that were moving faster in the United States than others. Like once, oh, there is one um, American company that did really well, Keen Footwear. Um, Keen moved away from PFOS, I think around like the same time a lot of the European companies did, maybe a couple years later. And that had to do with the Greenpeace uh, report. And the Green Science Policy Institute was working really, really hard to educate brands um, about the dangers of using these chemicals. And they run like, uh, the Green Science Policy Institute is amazing and great and founded by Arlene Bloom, who she's like a badass outdoors woman in general. She led like the first women's expedition on Annapurna. She's amazing. And um, if you want to learn more about PFAS, they have a website called PFAS Central, and that kind of puts out information on an ongoing basis of like updates on regulation, updates on products that no longer contain PFAS. Um, and also she overviews the six classes of harmful chemicals, which PFAS is the first one, but there are five others that they're trying to like push to be removed from consumer goods. Yeah, there's. If you want to go deep on this, you can just keep on going. I know. I'm there's, like trying to like filter it all in my brain and be like, okay, rein it in. <laughs> so, I mean, anyone listening to this will obviously be able to get a nice, deep but not too deep version of the story from your series, right? Like, how many episodes are there? Is, is it fifteen? I think. Um, there's ten. It's a ten part series. Um, and so. That's ideal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's not like hundreds right it's 10 you can get really yeah. deep with 10 yeah you know and it was hard to narrow it down like I'm glad that I focused like primarily on the outdoor industry because there's like a lot of rabbit holes to go down for other industries mm -hmm. like cosmetics for one I've been learning more about that and that's crazy I know I keep wow. saying crazy but I don't have another des descriptor for this topic <laughs> yeah. um it's unbelievable it's like, yeah it is unbelievable yeah. And it's a little scary. Like, I wish it was less scary, but it is like kind of heartbreaking that it has been unfolding in the way that it has and that there hasn't been responsibility taken for like clean drinking water, for instance, like that is a human right. And there should be no excuse for like industry being able to pollute the entire planet's drinking water sources. Yeah, when you put it like that, it's just, it's actually even hard to fathom how we got 
how we got here. <laughs> so the 10 part series, you, I just want to also frame for the listeners here that you cover, you, you interview experts throughout this 10 part series, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so there's, you cover interviews with chemists and epidemiologists. Epidemiologists. Lawyers, yeah, that's it. <laughs> um, so lawyers, consultants, certifying bodies, and outdoor brands, of course. So you've got quite a big spectrum from science to industry. They're all talking about how they're, how they're viewing this, which is, which is handy because you can get multiple perspectives. Mm-hmm. And so, so you mentioned a couple of brands that you are, that you're seeing doing, doing well. Who would you expect to be doing more? Like, who would you want to see doing more? (laughs) Or is it everyone? (laughs) Everyone. Everyone can be doing more, but there are definitely, like, bigger players in the industry that influence a lot of other behaviors. So, like, Patagonia would be an example. Like, they are generally moving in the right direction. However, it would be nice to see them like speaking out more about these types of things and like educating other brands. And like, it would have been nice to have seen them adopt these changes like faster. And then a large supplier for the outdoor industry is WL Gore and Associates, the makers of Gore-Tex. I have a lot to say about them. So I'm going to try and condense (laughs) this answer as much as possible. But essentially because they provide a lot of waterproofing for the outdoor industry, they have a lot of like control over like what is going into products. So like brands like Patagonia, Arcteryx, Outdoor Research, like they use Gore-Tex membranes in their products. Like they're not the ones producing them. They put them in. Um, And so like Gore has reformulated their membrane um, to move away from PFAS. However, they still use PFAS in a lot of their other um, product sets and in some of their membranes continually. So it would be nice, number one, to have them stop pushing back against regulation and legislation on PFAS. (laughs) Number two, to stop greenwashing PFAS in their marketing. And to also allow for more unbiased peer reviews of their scientific research. That sounds like a fair ask. Yes. Um, And there are alternatives. That's the big point, right? Like there are alternatives to use. It's not like there's, it's not like we have to make trade-offs here. There are alternatives. Yes, absolutely. And like, most of the brands that I talked to for the podcast, they did admit that the performance may be slightly different. However, they're doing their best to like educate consumers to be like, this is why we made the changes. We feel it's really important. We might need to change a few of our consumer behaviors. And like also the average consumer does not need a jacket that is going to allow them to summit a mountain or like work on an oil rig like the average consumer is wearing a rain jacket to walk their dog or go on a day hike and stuff like that you don't need like the best of the best performance you need adequate performance for safety and protection so I think kind of like addressing that mindset of we don't need (laughs) the highest performing jacket to do the things that we do on a daily basis and still stay dry 100% agree with that. Jeez. So now, which is a good, it's a good segue into the question around what are you, now that you know all of this, what are you doing personally to avoid PFAS in your own life? I mean, aside from, you know, (laughs) doing all the work you're doing to shine a light on the issue, but like for you personally and protecting yourself, what do you, what do you do? Well, I think the number one exposure for most consumers that one are not working in a facility that is manufacturing with PFAS and they don't live outside of a facility that is polluted by PFAS, the number one like exposure would be our drinking water. Like mm-hmm. there was a report put out by the EPA this year that said at least 60%, but probably more of the US drinking water is contaminated with PFAS. And so like most people are drinking this and they're unaware of it. And so I think the best thing people can be doing is finding a filter that can actually remove the bulk of these chemicals. We use a reverse osmosis filter in our house, um, and that does remove the PFAS, but there are other ones as well. Oftentimes they have some kind of like charcoal membrane, like the brand 
oh what is it Berkey Berkey filters does that sound right to you and they're like the big canister filters <laughs> I've used those before when I lived in North Carolina which has among the highest concentration of Gen X PFAS that's the filter that I used there okay. um but now I live in Washington State which still has PFAS pollution and the reverse osmosis works quite well. As far as consumer goods, I do not use any non-stick cookware because um, mm -hmm. even if it's not Teflon brand, more than likely it's using some type of chemical. So as it flakes off, as you cook with it, it can enter your food. I am vegan, so I don't eat any um, seafood. I don't eat any animal products um because in the united states another big polluter or another big exposure for people is actually our food um and mm -hmm. that's because another thing by the epa was uh it's called sludge so that's what that's what we call it in the united states which is essentially sewage waste so like when our human waste goes to a waste treatment plant um, there's a biosolid left over from the clean water and they needed something to do with it. So they said, let's give it to the farmers and we'll pay them to put it on their fields. But they didn't realize at the time that there was a high concentration of PFAS in that sludge. And so they were spreading it on the fields and entered the groundwater, which then like the cattle would be drinking. Um, and then it would enter also like leafy greens and things like that. And I know in like, Places like Maine, New Mexico, Texas, they have had recalls on things like beef and milk um, because it has such a high level of PFAS that it's no longer safe for human consumption. Um, so eliminating animal products has been like, I think is a good like way to go. Um, yeah. I know that it can also be transferred via plants, <laughs> but um yeah, those are it's probably, minimization like, at this point, right? Like it's yeah. impossible to completely eliminate exposure. <laughs> yeah, basically as much as you could minimize it. And I um I don't use cosmetics, so I don't use makeup or anything of that form um, because it's fairly unregulated, at least in the United States. Um, and a lot, a lot of makeup does contain PFOS. And like one like really good example would be like if it says waterproof so like waterproof mascara you could probably guarantee that has pfos because what else is making it waterproof right right yeah that's a good that's a good tip um and i was just thinking about what, what's in my cupboard like i've got old range not old as in like old before pfos was born old but like old probably right in smack bang in the middle of pfos usage old um they are forever chemicals. So those would for sure still be, because they're waterproof, they'd still be there. It's not like they off gas or whatever, you know, like they, yeah. they're they there, right? So that's kind of, so have you offloaded products that you've previously worn that you think might have PFAS on them? Clothing wise, not really, honestly. Um, when it comes to like outer apparel, um, which... I, honestly, most of my outer apparel is like from brands like Houdini. Um, so I know that they're like slightly more responsibly made, but like my older equipment, so like tents and backpacks and stuff that would have a waterproofing solution or even jackets, I guess, that could potentially have it. They're not touching my skin directly. Um, and mm -hmm. since there's not like that dermal contact, I'm not really as concerned. I guess there's always a possibility. But then I also have to consider like, if I were to throw this into the rubbish and it goes to landfill, then what happens to the PFOS? Like, right. it's just it's going to, in your yeah. yeah, it's like, it's probably better that I continue to use it because it's already been made. Um, it's such a low exposure concern, at least for me. Yeah. Like, I could be wrong. I, I'm not a scientist. <laughs> so yeah. um, I could be wrong about that. But I think if you're not putting it right against your skin, I would be more concerned for things like... Um, menstrual products or underwear um, or even like leggings, um, like exercise clothes, like ones that are like right against more sensitive parts of my body um, and would be like direct content, co direct contact mm -hmm. while I'm sweating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's been all this news on last year on the, on menstrual, on the period underwear, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what, what brand was it? Like you thinks underwear or something Thanks, like that. Yeah, and then they did a test and a whole lot of them came up as having PFAS. Like there's actually yeah. only a limited few. And I, I think didn't. 
one big problem that is worth noting is because PFAS is used so broadly in production, like it's possible that like someone making period underwear, they never actually added PFAS to Ooh. that product or that apparel and that it was contaminated during production. And one example, um, the representative from Keen Footwear, when they were doing their testing and phasing it out, there was even contamination from like receipts, like paper receipts that they were putting in their boxes of shoes was then getting oh, onto their products. And then they tested it and found out it came from the receipts. And so there's like all these contamination areas going on um, in production. So I think companies are trying to figure out how to like eliminate contamination, but it feels obvious to me that it's like, just stop using it everywhere and then nothing yeah. will be contaminated. Totally, yeah, because it's so hard for a small brand who's trying to do the right thing but doesn't have extensive testing capabilities, right, and is thinking, assuming that they're, you know, buying their production inputs from places that don't have PFAS contamination. So, yeah, I think widespread regulation is going to be the, the, the most impactful force here, hopefully. Mm -hmm. But let's talk about what's next for you. What's, because uh, I think we could probably talk about this all day, but <laughs> I want people to come and listen to your podcast to, to get the whole story. Um, so, so I want to know more about what's next for you this year. You've, you've closed out the, you're still releasing the episodes, but you've closed out for the year. Um, I mean, you've closed out that series in terms of your production, right? So what's, what's next? What are you going to focus on? Yeah, so Forever Chemicals podcast, the last episode should be coming out at the end of April of 2024. And when we were like wrapping up production, <laughs> we were trying to talk like, what should we work on next? Because we were so focused on this for so long. And our main thought was like kind of seeing how this performs um, in terms of like listenership and like interest. Um, and we have considered like potentially doing a second season primarily on cosmetics, actually. Um, oh, wow. Just to kind of like because the PFAS conversation is so expansive we were like there's so much more information that we wanted to include or we wanted to communicate but we just kind of ran out of time and we didn't we wanted to make it digestible like the average consumer could listen to this learn something and not feel overwhelmed um mm -hmm. and so i think like potentially pursuing a second season like i'm not saying we're actually doing that i'm saying we had a conversations about it um, and so we're kind of looking for funding. I've been applying to a lot of different grants um, in the last month or so um, to hopefully get funding for either, yeah, a second season of Forever Chemicals or working on other projects like documentaries and things like that. It sounds like it's going to be an exciting year. Yeah. Um, and cosmetics would be great. I would love to listen to that. We, yeah. You know, we talk a lot about cosmetics on our website, so to be informed at a deeper level on this topic for, for that purpose would be amazing, selfishly. <laughs> I know, I am not like a huge consumer of cosmetics, so I actually didn't really, like I didn't think about it, like it wasn't top of mind for me, um, but mm. my brother's wife uh, used to be a cosmetologist and then our family friend, his girlfriend is, she's a wonderful makeup artist, like amazing. Um, and they were like learning about all of this with us or with me and they were like I need to look at her makeup like I want to make sure she's not putting that stuff on her face you know like that's scary yeah. to me as her partner that like that's happening so they kind of are the ones who are like spearheaded that idea and I, I was like yeah that's actually a really good point and more people need to be talking about this but I did see that New Zealand is banning PFAS and makeup so maybe Australia is close behind I don't know. We can be we can be pretty far behind on a lot of things. So. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it can be quite frustrating. Um, but Meg, here is a question that we ask every guest on our show. If you could have one message or piece of advice truly heard instantly by everyone on the planet, what would that be? <laughs> I want to think oh. of a really good answer. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say, this is going to sound counterintuitive, um, I think, um, like when I first say it out loud, but I would say that we need to be doing less. So we need to be doing less shopping. We need to be doing less 
working, uh, doing less screen time. Like we need to spend more time being and less time doing and like kind of like returning to what it means to be human. And I think as the more people that are aligning with their like local environments, the better we are going to build community, the better that we are going to like understand ourselves and hopefully the better we'll take care of each other and the planet. Absolutely. That connection to the, to the natural environment is so crucial and is increasingly being lost. So I think that's brilliant advice. Um, and for those who are listening, who want to support the outdoor minimalist and this PFAS series, where can they do that? How can they find you? So I would say social media wise, we're most active on Instagram and our handle is at outdoor.minimalist.book. Uh, we also have a website, which is the outdoor uh, We have a page for forever chemicals on there as well. Um, and then we're on all major podcast platforms and we do have a YouTube channel, which is at the outdoor minimalist. Um, and so if you just go on to like Apple Podcasts or Spotify, Google, wherever you listen to your podcast, you can either search Outdoor Minimalist, which is my rich, my first podcast, or if you want to listen specifically to the Forever Chemicals series, you can search Forever Chemicals um, and it should pop up under the chemistry category. Perfect. And of course, we'll link it in our show notes as well. So folks can find you very easily. So Meg, thank you. Thank you so much for that that education on PFAS and Forever Chemicals today. It's been enlightening and I'm sure that it will help drive that change that we need on this important issue. So thank you for that and the work that you're doing on this. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Wow, that was honestly a tough episode. As, as regular listeners know, we tend to focus more on positive stories, but this issue is so concerning and really needs some immediate action, so we felt we needed to cover it. And who better to do so than the extremely knowledgeable Meg Carney. Big thanks to Meg for the work that she and her team are doing on this. We hope that you found this informative and feel motivated to listen to her series and take some action. Thank you for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you hear, let me know. Leave a review and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. You can find us on Instagram at outdoor.minimalist.book, on YouTube, or subscribe to our weekly newsletter at theoutdoorminimalist.com. For even more updates, other educational resources, and to help build an outdoor community with the shared goal to create a better outdoor space as we recreate.